Uh, I'll be presenting on the Working Alliance uh, in MDMA therapy. And uh, I was asked the question earlier about what interests me about psychedelic research. And uh, I think one of the things that I'm, what really sort of attracts me to it are the sort of difficult methodological questions that you have to work with when you're trying to evaluate um, something that's both psychotherapy and pharmacology. Um, so to sort of put this into a larger context, you can think about the late 1980s with the rise of Prozac and the use of prescription um, medication to treat various psychological disorders. And there was sort of a crisis within the psychotherapy field because um, if you can give somebody uh, a drug, then what is the role of psychotherapy? So what that did is it sort of, uh, in the early 90s, there was a push to use the randomized control trial, or sort of a, a more of a medical model, to psychotherapy research uh, to get evidence for um, the efficacy of psychotherapy. And I tell you all of this because I think it's really interesting that a lot of the research into psychotherapy and psychopharmacology, it's sort of pitting the two things against each other, at least within this, that context. And here, with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy or psychedelic or drug-assisted psychotherapy, it's not about which one is better. It's how we can combine them and how can they be used together. And that's really the idea that I'm really interested in. I'm interested in how can we study that. So I wanted to tell you I'm going to have to be looking to the side a little bit here because I don't have it in front of me. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about what psychotherapy researchers do. Um, so they look at different factors. They look at what kind of techniques or, or sort of models of psychotherapy might work, um, both in terms of process and outcome. They also look at uh, psychotherapist variables. So what, what about a psychotherapist might make them a good therapist that might make uh, outcome positive? They also look at patient variables, and this is really important because it's not just looking at things like their diagnosis, so when they, they need to meet a certain criteria to be, for example, within a study. Um, it's also really important to look at symptomatology because those can present differently. And these are all sorts of different factors that can often be ignored um, or are ignored in um, a, lot of, um, a lot of studies. So it's really important to look at all these different factors. Uh, and then, of course, the therapeutic relationship, which is something that I'm going to focus on. So what is the connection between the, th the therapist and patient, and how does that contribute to the process and outcome of uh, therapy? And then finally, um, important events, uh, either identified by the, the patient or the therapist, or an observer. And that's actually, in this case, I'll be presenting uh, a little feasibility study uh, of um, coder coders or observers who are watching video recorded uh, psycho MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD and their sort of observations. So I like to use this quote. Uh, here it says that, that MDMA may provide a clear perspective of the trauma as a past event with a heightened awareness of the support and safety that exists in the present. And if you're familiar with the idea of the working alliance um, or the therapeutic relationship, you can kind of think about how uh, the support and safety are particularly important words um, within that context. So for those who don't know what the Working Alliance is, um, it's a part of the therapeutic relationship and it's thought of, it's, it's theorized to have three parts, a goal, task, and bond. Goal is simply, what is the goal of the therapy? So if somebody is, has anxiety, their goal is to go to therapy to relieve their anxiety. Uh, the task is whatever activities um, within the ther therapy session um, is sort of part of the, part of the, the therapy model. And it's um, here we're going to be looking at whether, pe whether the therapist and patient are engaged within a task. And then the bond, which is the connection between the therapist and um, the, the patient. So that can be an emotional connection, it can be trust, uh, things like that. And what's really important to keep in mind is that this is a pan-theoretical model, which means that it doesn't matter if you're doing one kind of therapy, whether you're doing CBT or dynamic therapy or MDMA-assisted therapy. This, this, the therapeutic relationship, the working alliance, is always at play. Um, so <laughs> within psychotherapy research, this is a sort of an interesting finding because um, through meta-analyses, looking at multiple studies, it's been, it's been found uh, repeatedly that one of the predictors of positive outcome, of improvement, is this relationship, is the working alliance. Um, 
And that's really interesting because it's really hard to find predictors of outcome within this research because there's so many variables. But the thing is that this is said a lot and it's true and it's really important, but, it, but the working alliance only explains five to like seven percent of the variance in change. So you can only explain five to seven percent of the, the change um, in the, at the end of the, the therapy, which isn't really a whole lot. That means there's a whole lot of other things that we kind of don't really know why, uh, what, what's helping. Um, and then the contrary is true. So if you have a poor alliance, then um, it's predictive of, studies have shown it to be predictive of dropout, patient dropout. And the thing to keep in mind is that the working alliance is constantly uh, shifting. It's not like you establish a good relationship in the beginning of your therapy, and then that's it, you're done, it's all okay. Even within a single session, it can fluctuate, and that's what I'll be presenting. So, the opposite is, um, speaking a little bit more about the negative working alliance, um, Jeremy Safran at uh, the new school where I, uh, where I go to school, um, he looks at ruptures. So that is, so some sort of um, negative ship in the, shift in the working alliance. Uh, and that's not necessarily um, a, a bad thing. I mean, if, it's, if these ruptures, if these moments aren't addressed, then it can lead to uh, dropout. But these uh, events can also be used uh, for positive change. So you could look at um, a rupture and address it, and then that could sort of repair the relationship. It can cr increase the bond. But um, it could also help as, as the, uh, therapeutic material to sort of address the interpersonal style of the, the client or patient, um, things like that. So within sort of this context is um, what the SWEO, or the Segmented Working Alliance Inventory Observer Form, or what I'll refer to as SWEO, it's this measure that I've, I'll be using, I'll presenting, be pre presenting the data from. So sort of within this context that this was developed. And what the SWEO seeks to do is monitor the changes in the working alliance over time, over uh, a session. So this, is, this slide is simply to indicate that when measuring something like the working alliance, um, you, can ask, you can have a self-report self measure where you ask the patient, you give them a form at the end of a session, you say, uh, you know, how, in fewer words, how do you uh, how do you feel about your therapist? Do you trust your therapist? Do you have a good understanding? And that's one way of measuring this, but there, you could think of reasons why um, that might not necessarily be the best way to, to do this because uh, a, a, a participant or patient might not necessarily be willing to criticize their therapist for a number of reasons. So what we do is we use an observer form. So what we do is we have coders who are trained in looking at certain things that are going on within the therapy session and they observe the therapy in action and they sort of make these kinds of judgments. So what distinguishes the SWEO from other measures of the working alliance is that not only is it observer form, but it also looks across five minute segments within a therapy session. So instead of just getting one data point at the end of uh, the therapy, we can look over time, over every five minutes and see how that, that relationship is changing. So we train coders, uh, usually two coders are assigned per, um, uh, per segment of, of video, and they, uh, we look at reliability uh, to make sure that so there's, a, there's agreement, so there's the sort of um, observer aspect of it. And also, um, the, the SWEO itself uh, has very good reliability and also very good um, uh, validity in terms of uh, other correlations with uh, rupture and alliance. So this is what the SWEO looks like. I don't know if you can read it, and I'm actually having a hard time reading it from this angle, but um, there are six task items. So remember, if I, I, I said in the beginning that the working alliance consists of goals, task, and bond. Goal is left out because really your goal in therapy doesn't change every five minutes. Um, usually it's sort of set. Um, the, the, the ta well, for some, maybe. Um, but the task, um, uh, these are the task item and these are the uh, bond items. Uh, so this is an example of a bond item. There is good un understanding between the client and the therapist. You may think, okay, well, here I'm the, an observer, I'm watching this recorded therapy session. How the heck do I know what is actually going in the mind of either the, the therapist or, um, or patient? Well, what we do is we look for evidence. So you can see this is a Likert scale from one to seven. 
four is sort of uh, no evidence or equal evidence for supporting that item. Um, one is that there's strong evidence against the item, and seven is that there's strong evidence for the item. So a patient might say in therapy to, to the therapist, well, I, I really feel like you understand you know, my situation. So there's clear evidence of, um, of a person saying that there's a good understanding. So we'd rate it a six or seven, um, depending. And then each single one of these items, so there's, again, 12 items, six bond, six task, each number has a, a, an anchor to it. So we're really always, and we spend a lot of time getting trained in this and um, making sure that we're reliable and that we're understanding uh, the th what we're observing in the same way. So what's really neat about this is that you can take this data and you can plug it in and you can do t-tests and you can do other sorts of sort of analyses to look at how it relates to outcome. But you can also do something called control charting. And control charting was developed really in manufacturing. And what they wanted, in, they wanted to do is they wanted to see um, how a certain measurement changes over time and whether changes in those measurements uh, deviate for some sort of, from some sort of expected um, uh, value. Uh, so, you know, if you imagine, I, I like to, for some reason, like to use the example of a bolt uh, that's being produced and it has a certain diameter, and it's okay for that diameter to deviate a little bit, but if it deviates too far, then it's an indication that something's wrong. So you might want to go to the bolt machine and see well, what, what's going on with it that it's producing this sort of, um, this kind of irregularity. And we're, that's what we're doing with the Working Alliance, which is kind of cool. <clears throat> so this is an example of a control chart. Um, You'll see that the, the, the x-axis has time, so that's five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. The y-axis is the average SWEO score. And you can see here that it's at a four, meaning um, four is no evidence, pro or against, and then seven is uh, evidence for a strong um, alliance. Now, what is important to note is that the solid line going through the middle is the, the average of the SWEO measure across uh, the entire session. The, uh, dotted lines are uh, the two standard deviations, or uh, two sigma, two standard deviations from a mean. So any point, any of those diamonds that you see that fall above or below um, that uh, dotted line means that there's something significant happening. Uh, so the, in the research with ruptures, uh, a point that is below the dotted line, the lower dotted line, is an indication of a rupture. Uh, but we really don't have uh, any sort of word for what happens when those points go above the, the, the top bottom line. I, I, I'm using the word positive, uh, a positive moment. I was going to use peak, but then I was thinking like peak experience. That's probably like confounding a little bit. Rapture. Yeah. <laughs> about this a little bit e more easily. So this is a 25-year-old uh, Caucasian male who's uh, diagnosed with PTSD for four years. And uh, this is uh, a video material that was given to me from a previous uh, MDMA uh, research study. So it's not something that, I'm not a therapist. I'm not doing this work. Uh, I'm simply doing uh, the research on it. And uh, as you may know, you know, those prep sessions will last about 90 minutes. There's uh, the drug session, which can last uh, up to eight hours. Uh, and then there uh, are the integration sessions, which are also 90 minutes long. And what makes this unique and also very uh, difficult is that there are two therapists in the room at the same time. So I'll talk about this more, but you can think about the working alliance is usually conceptualized between one therapist and one patient. And things get really difficult when you have two people or three people. Um, so, I'm going to try to do this. I've got some quotes from therapy sessions and uh, also this here. So, if you look at, so this is a control chart. You can see the male therapist is in orange, the female therapist is in, um, in green. And uh, there are various points. So point A, uh, the, the patient is talking about art, about school assignments, about the enjoyment of learning language. Um, so this is sort of, uh, you could call it like a building of rapport, but the, the, um, the point isn't necessarily really high. It's sort of just kind of making small talk in the beginning of a session. At point B, we see a, a peak, and the, the therapist is uh, describing what might what the, th uh, the patient might expect uh, during uh, the MDMA experience. And also, she's 
she, she mentions how she's going to be taking uh, blood pressure measurements and how that can sort of startle the patient and she's, she's preparing him for it and she's doing it in a very sort of caring way so it's, it's high up there. So it's both sort of task oriented um, and also there's a bond element there. Then at point C there's a dip down and here, in this dip the, um, the patient is talking about uh, the patient is talking about lucid dreaming. And you would think that lucid dreaming is really relevant to sort of non-ordinary states. But the way he's talking, he's not talking about his dreams. He's talking about different techniques that can elicit lucid dreaming. And that's sort of a little bit less personal. The, it's, the bond isn't necessarily there. And it's sort of related on the task. It's still above a four, so it's still positive. But it's not really um, necessarily doing th therapy, if you will. Um, now, at point D, uh, the patient is talking about how his military career has shaped him, uh, the knowledge and wisdom he's gained, and some of the unusual experiences he's had, and, and how he shared those unusual experiences uh, when he was younger, and how he was made fun of for um, sharing them. And, the, and he says, I can't figure out my PTSD. And the male therapist responds by saying, well, that sounds extremely intense. And he says, we are prepared to be here Anything that happens, any experiences that you have, I'm glad we are talking about some of these things that are unusual and people thought you were crazy because you're not going, we're not going to think you're crazy. Whatever happens, we are here to support your process, all three of us, with whatever you need. So there you can see sort of explicit uh, speech of both the bond and, and uh, or focus on the, the task. And the, the patient responds by saying, I really feel that this is something important. I was signing papers and I opened up to you guys. I can never do that. So again, very explicitly, I can talk about things that I can't talk with uh, or other people, or I can't do myself. Um, now, this is a, this something that's going to come up, and I'm not going to be focusing on ruptures as much because of the, this confound that came up. Um, because there are two people, the, the two therapists aren't talking at the same time. Uh, and of, often the reason why the two therapists are there at the same place is so that if one person needs to go to the restroom or if something else needs to, to happen, they need to take care of some sort of logistical thing, they can replace each other. So what that, in the coding that we're doing, it comes up as a false positive. It looks like a, a big dip. It's still, it's, a, it's, it's going down to a four, which is neutral. So we're not even in the one, two, three, which would be poor alliance, which would be sort of like, the therapist maybe this is an extreme example, maybe like offending the, the patient. That, we're not detecting that at all. Um, but uh, still, these are these false alarms, and I'm going to sort of address that later on, how we're going to remove that. But if you see a lot of dips, don't, don't be alarmed. <laughs> um, it's usually just the absence of any evidence to suggest a strong alliance at that moment. So here's a, uh, oh, I didn't say that was a prep session. This is a, an experimental or drug session. And this is focusing on the male therapist. And the, uh, the patient is speaking about his experience in Iraq. And this is the three points. So that would be really 15 minutes. And this is something I selected from the, the most peak uh, point. Um, I think it's around like 70 minutes. And just so you know, just, in, uh, well, I'll say this in a second. So, to, um, the patient says, I think I was angry at myself. I think I was punishing myself for being a killer. And I don't know, you always have a choice, but in a way, I had no choice. If I didn't, I would have died. And if I would have died, I would have caused my friends to die. And whenever an enemy decides to pick up a gun, they are just as much engaged in that situation. They chose to die in that situation. Whenever I shot people, I didn't really feel anything. I didn't feel excited, I didn't feel bad. I just felt really numb and I think that scared me. And then when I get back here and think of all these things I've done, I feel bad for them, for doing those things and acting the way that I did. And the male therapist says, are you feeling some of that sadness now? And the patient says, I don't. When I think about it, the same thoughts come into my head, but I'm not bothered by them. I kind of, I keep using the word understand. I just understand. Like normally, the, the feelings that rush up in there that make me emotional, I just really feel, I feel like I understand why I cried and why I felt the way that I did now. The past is the past and those things are always going to be with me. They're never going to go away. They're ca carved into my soul. And what, why you see that big dip that comes right after this 
is actually the, the, the ther therapist tells the patient, well, why don't you go inside and focus inward for a moment? So there's these shifts within these experimental sessions where there's, they're speaking together and there's shifts where um, the patient is sort of going in to sort of explore their, their emotions or what's going on internally. So again, it's, it's not a, a rupture necessarily, but it's, um, there isn't a conversation going on. So this is just another example. This is the second half of the uh, first drug session at about 205 minutes. And we're looking at the female therapist now. And the participant is speaking about um, a visualization exercise he had performed. Uh, and previously he did this exercise and he saw this demonic um, creature that was shacked up in, shackled up in this uh, cell. And so now he's doing the visualization exercise for a second time. And he says, I had one. Uh, he's referring to a visualization, and he says, uh, I had one that I was keeping to myself, and I can't feel but want to say it. And so the patient speaks about uh, the visualization he had and how that demonic creature that he saw previously uh, is now released from his shackles. He goes into the cell, and all that's there is, are the, the, the shackles and the no creature. And he says, um, and the participant relates the demonic creature to himself and how he is able to release that creature from with, within himself. And the patient says, I was going to keep it to myself, but I really can't help it. Uh, it was really weird because I didn't think that I, it had to, anything to do with anything, uh, the previous uh, visualization. But, but, the, um, but I thought it was just me being playful. Even if it was, I created it in my mind, and that's how I, my mind related it back to me, for me to, understand ver for me to understand very powerful images. And the therapist responds by saying, very powerful, yes. I'm glad you didn't keep it to yourself. Thanks for sharing it with us. So you can see that kind of connection there. And the patient says, I keep having these, these things sometimes. I guess it's natural, but you want to say things. And a part of you is like, no, 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 keep, keep your mouth shut. But then I feel very comfortable. Why not? So I already had this with you all before, but I think the MDMA really helps you realize how silly that is. Again, silly how it is to, to not share something that you, you kind of want to share. Again, that's a uh, strong bond, you know, again, very task-oriented. So we can think about like, how um, really cool it is that this, this visualization happened and the metaphor of the, the creature. But what this is, what's really this is focusing on is really the connection between the, the patient and the therapist and how willing they are and open they are about ex being explicit about their, their sort of connection that they have. Um, so this is an integration session. So I wanted to sort of select from the different types of sessions that we have. This is about uh, the peak at 75 minutes. And uh, the patient is talking about his experiences with uh, explosions in Iraq and the loss of some of his friends and how his, ve his vehicle was, um, was blown up. And he's talking about it's, it's very sort of heavy. And the, the female therapist says, how are you doing talking about all of this? What are you noticing? So she's bringing uh, sort of his attention to what's going on um, as he's sharing this, this information. And he says, I noticed that before I used to feel, uh, feel in my body a uh, tension. And part of me wants to say I shouldn't feel this way. But the more I talk about it, the more I feel like I'm just chatting about it, like I would with people over some drinks. I feel fine about it. I think it's just that I thought I had acceptance about this stuff before. But now I realize that I have better acceptance of it. It is what it is, and it happened. I used to have a problem, especially with my whole getting blown up experience, and what I could have done and everything. And, what, and that gets you nowhere. You're not going to be able to actually go back in time and do anything different. I used to be able to tell myself those things before, but it just wouldn't sink in. But now I think it, it has. Perhaps it has. So this is just to, I'm not going to be presenting any content here, but this slide is just to illustrate that we can actually overlap the two graphs. So we can, in some ways, explore how the two therapists are kind of interacting and when things are in sync and when things are out of sync. Um, this is not a control chart um, because they're on the same sort of uh, 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 scale. Um, and then what we can also do, and again, I don't have this, any content to go here, but we can split up the task and bond, because they're both subscales of a, of a larger scale. Um, 
Here, you know, there's very minor differences, but you can, there are other cases where, you can, where the differences are more apparent, and this is really neat, because we can see there may be times, I'm thinking where in a therapy session, where the therapist might ask the patient about what kind of um, pain relief he's using for a headache or something like that, or there, there's, there, there's a high task, so they're doing something that's oriented towards the therapy, but it's not necessarily this sort of affective kind of moment of, of closeness between them. So we can pick that apart and also analyze that. Um, not just this is all qualitative, but we can all, so we can pinpoint these moments. But we can also use this in other kinds of analyses that are more, um, I guess you could say, quantitative. So the strengths of this model is that it's um, an observer-based measure of the working alliance. Uh, we can use it control charts to look at uh, changes over time in the working alliance, and we can look at task and bond separately. Um, it also allows for the, uh, the identification of important moments in the therapy session, which is really important, particularly for training, which is something that might be used in, you know, in the future. Find good examples of um, high alliance and then use that to, to train people in therapy. But also the opposite is true, and this is what um, the, some of the research with ruptures is at the brief. It's b being able to identify ruptures or moments where um, something is, uh, might be off and being able to uh, train therapists to know how to address those, those moments. So limitations. Well, I call it the, the case of the fours, and this is uh, when we have those sort of false alarms for ruptures. And what I'm going to uh, do moving forward is simply add a code to the measure where the observers can say, well, the, the, the therapist was out of the room, or uh, the, the patient was uh, focusing inward with uh, headphones and blindfolds, and he was laying back. Uh, so then we could sort of include that into the data and then it, uh, prevent these false alarms from coming up, which will hopefully allow for the, the um, identification of more sort of drop rupture moments, which I think are really important. We shouldn't neglect them. Uh, and then, of course, the limitations is this is a single case. This is just a sort of a feasibility type situation, a feasibility study. Um, and the, the, the participant is, was a really great, almost like an ideal uh, patient in a way, because extremely motivated, had a really good ability to sort of integrate um, the, uh, the experiences he had. Uh, and um, it's, again, w it, ruptures will happen, and it's important to identify those moments and know how we can incorporate uh, both the positive and the, the, the difficult uh, moments in psychotherapy. So what can we go moving forward? Well, um, there are a lot of questions we can ask. Um, does the therapeutic alliance change before and after the administration of MDMA? Um, is SWEO predictive of outcome? Is the working here alliance predictive of outcome like it has been in other studies? Um, and I wanted to bring up another study which is, uh, I think is kind of relevant, and that's uh, the study was conducted looking at um, the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder with a particular type of uh, training which taught um, participants how to do uh, enhance their interpersonal skills and also how to do negative affect management. And what the study found was that with, in, with therapists and through this therapy, um, the working alliance did predict uh, positive outcome change, but that, that change was uh, mediated by uh, the ability for the, of the patient to uh, regulate their negative affect. So we can kind of think about how that training might be replaced by MDMA in a way, so allowing for um, that negative affect to not sort of inhibit uh, the, the, the relationship and the focus on the task of therapy. It's, it's a hypothesis, it's, it's an idea. Um, and then we can look at things that more minutely. We can look at uh, the, the working alliance in particular sessions and how those might be different or if they might be important or different moments within uh, particular uh, sessions. And just like the ruptures might are used um, within uh, this rupture repair therapy by uh, Jeremy Safran, um, uh, maybe the, the rupture moments are uh, important in that therapy, and maybe here the peak moments are something that could be predictive of something. So I'd like to end by thanking, uh, of course, MAPS, uh, all the, the wonderful people who work there, uh, also Michael and, and Mithofer, and also the, the New School for Social Research, where I, I study, and uh, my coding team um, with whom this would not be possible, and also uh, uh, my professors. Thank you. We have time to take some questions, and uh, if there are any, let me know. Hello. Um, it's very important, uh, the secrecy, uh, that the patient knows that what is told about stays between us two. Um, uh, because of shame, but also because of military secrets, for example. 
And how far is your monitoring influencing that process? So uh, I'm not sure if I understand. So no, you're, yeah, uh, you're talking about blinding and whether the observers... No, no. I, I mean, if, if, if you're observing the process, how much is that influencing the therapy, the psychotherapy? Because uh, th there's a third one listening or monitor or, or videoing what has been uh -huh. uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. So does, does having... So there's no, there isn't another observer in the room, so that's not a factor, but the fact that the, the therapy is being video recorded, does that somehow affect the session? I've had d interesting discussions with different people who have different opinions about that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, some people think that it, uh, I mean, as a, as a patient, you know, knowing that, you're, that something's being recorded, it might, yeah, inhibit your ability to express yourself. You might be afraid. Um, but from what I've talked about other researchers who, I think, it, I think there's just a mixed opinion about it. Some people think it matters and some people think it doesn't. And I guess maybe that's an empirical question that can be answered. And we could look at that in studies that have this recording, whether there's worse outcome. But I mean, certainly in the, uh, I don't know if we, that analysis was done in the studies by MAPS, but um, I, I don't think it's really that big of a factor. That's my personal opinion. It's not. I'm just curious as to how many cases you could actually perform an analysis with, since clearly you're generating a lot of a lot of data. It seems like it's a very it produces a high granularity or low a lot of data, high granularity data. Can you do three subjects, four or five, and can you then compare them in different conditions, say different doses of MDMA or in different situations? Right. Well, that's a that's another sort of. In a way, it's a weakness because it uh, takes some time to train the coders, and then it takes a lot of time to actually do the doing the code to do the coding, and then you know th this, these therapy sessions are really long. Most therapy is 45 minutes, 50 minutes, uh, even 90 minutes or eight hours. So, um, no, it is a, it is a challenge, and that you know something that you know we have to consider in terms of the size of the N, um, whether we're going to look at every single session, whether we're going to select certain sessions. Um, but then you're right, it is highly granular. So there's certain kind of statistical analyses that you can do when you have a lot of data points, but not necessarily uh, a large N. But I don't know if that answers your question, but it's something that we're definitely considering. And yeah. Uh, thanks, Igmar. That was great. Um, just a comment on the, the question about the video. I, I don't know the answer to that, but one point I'd like to make is we tell people ahead of time if there's ever a point when you think the video is inhibiting you from talking about something, we will turn the cameras off. Because we say, you know, the video is very helpful to us for research and, and um, training purposes, but the primary thing is your process. And that does happen occasionally. People ask us to turn it off for a while if they want to talk about something. Not that often, but I think that's, that helps with that question. But our impression is most of the time people just kind of forget about the cameras after a while. And as you say, there's no camera person in the room. They're just the cameras are there. Yeah, thank you very much for, for saying that. Thanks, thanks so much for um, seeing that. It's really interesting. Um, I was just wondering about the ruptures. And, um, you know, is it important to see if there's repair um, later on? I mean, it seems like that would be difficult if you're just looking at segments. Can you say to see if there was a... A repair, a repair of a repair. rupture. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, in, within the research, um, yeah, that's part of looking at using the SWAO um, at um, the brief psychotherapy research program. They look at how when it goes back up, and that could be uh, a repair. Yeah. I mean, that's that's sort of yeah a really important part of part of this. I haven't actually gone to the data myself and looked, um, but this, that's the thing. You know, we haven't really. So, I mean, it's, it's, it comes down to how you defi define a rupture, and a rupture isn't like, it can be this explosive moment where the, the, the participant, you know, gets really angry or something, you can really see it, but it can also, there's something called like a withdrawal rupture, or simply, uh, you know, in therapy where a patient might not just talk for a while and kind of change subjects or something. They can be very subtle, and that's why the SWAO was designed. Um, you know, in the analysis that I've, I've done, I ha we haven't identified any kind, many of those rupture moments. Um, I think when they become more apparent, uh, and again, that's partly a consequence of the confound of the force, because it's, it's changing the, the data. 
Um, I think once that confound is eliminated, we can then go to try to identify some rupture moments and see how those, how those are repaired. Yeah. I have a question over here. I think you're Did you want to ask follow-up? Huh? Um, I, I have a separate question, uh, if that one's done. Um, over, I'm over to your far I left. I think you're behind the light, so I can't, or where are you? <laughs> I'm over to your far left over okay, here. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll address this uh, to you, Ingmar, and also to, to Michael and, and Anne. Um, I'm thinking about Dan Siegel's work around uh, rupture repair in child, uh, in, in child rearing and how important that is to acknowledge when there has been a rupture and to repair that, and also in the, the psychotherapy process. And you know, he talks about that being a, an, an oxytocin-driven uh, process, you know, that, that the experience of being felt gives the is probably uh, modulated by oxytocin. And if this emerging data around MDMA and oxytocin um, bears out. So I'm wondering, from a sort of clinical standpoint, does MDMA uh, facilitate acknowledging and then repairing that rupture sort of in real time in, in the psychotherapy session, mm -hmm. maybe more so than, than a non-MDMA type session might? That's a great question. Yeah, I don't have an answer to it, but I think that's a really great question. And I think, yeah, the, the sort of the oxytocin hypothesis is, is one of the things I think sort of contributed to the selection of the SWEO, um, or the working alliance as being a, um, something to look at. And it was in, actually, I didn't mention this. I had the, in, um, let's see if we go back. So the, the 2008 study that was published by uh, Brousseau and et al, um, they were looking at the working alliance. They were using a different measure, but um, it's something that's thought of as being an important thing to look at while doing uh, the, this kind of research. Uh -huh. Hi, Ingmar. Um, Hi. <laughs> I actually, upon seeing the control charts, I realized that kind of the method of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy relies on going within and alternating so we're going to probably end up with really wide ranges for the sigma level cutoffs just as a like inherent part of this analysis. So how do you propose that we address this in terms of future analyses um, because we may actually be missing ruptures or raptures um, <laughs> just as a result of the wide variance in the data? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, um, so again, it's, I think of the inclusion of uh, in, an item that will, you, so <clears throat> I, w I, I want to make an item, a very simple one, that will um, have different categories, and we can have the coder look and say, well, th out of the room, or, you know, working, you know, inward or whatever. And then what we can do is simply exclude that segment out of the data, out of the, the mean, uh, so then it won't be uh, skewed into, into one direction. And I want to thank you all for very much for coming. We have a break now that's about a half an hour, and we'll resume uh, 11 o'clock.